Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the second lecture um, of the spring semester here at SciArc. Uh, so I'd like to begin this lecture. It's, it's kind of funny. There's a coincidence uh, involved in, in my introduction for tonight's speaker is that often I have one of my favorite authors uh, is Jorge Luis Borges. Uh, often I use a kind of quote um, from this Argentinian writer uh, when I am writing a text or introducing something. And as I looked at the site um, for the Bloom game, uh, of which the Bloom project, um, of which Jose is a partner in the, in the development of that, that project, uh, I came across a small quote from the Garden of Forking Paths, um, which was that all possible branches are real. Uh, this really led me into looking again at that text, really looking at the story, thinking about, as he writes, the ways in which a book can be infinite, um, and really thinking about the ways in which a space can be infinite. And I think that is something that our speaker, in a sense, is dealing with. Um, so I just wanted to read a quote from that text to contextualize uh, this way of thinking about some of the work. The Garden of Forking Paths is an incomplete but not false image of the universe as Sui Pen conceived it. In contrast to Newton and Schopenhauer, your ancestor did not believe in a uniform absolute time. He believed in an infinite series of times, in a growing dizzying net of divergent, convergent, and parallel times. The network of times which approached one another forked, broke off, or were unaware of one another for centuries embraces all possibilities of time. We do not exist in the majority of these times. In some, you exist and not I. In others, I and not you. And in others, both of us. So I think that aspect of how a work of fiction, how a text um, could possibly embed multiple outcomes is very related uh, to the work of, uh, to Jose's work. Um, I think the combining of both digital and non-digital interfaces, the development of parallel spaces that coexist and sometimes overlap, um, seems to me to characterize quite well this body of work. And I think it's something that a lot of us here at SciArc um, are currently engaged in looking at some of these issues of how, uh, you know, can we really characterize as something as being purely digital space or um, a sort of physical construct, an artifact, an object, an image. I mean, how the sort of transactions between these spaces, between the space of a, a processing script um, or the space of a uh, fabricated um, component, how those things begin to actually overlap and merge is something I, I find really provocative in the work and I think really will give us uh, much to consider here. So. Um, Jose Sanchez is an architect, programmer, game designer uh, based in Los Angeles, California. He's the partner at Bloom Games, as I mentioned, which is a startup that was built upon the Bloom Project, which I hope we'll see tonight in the lecture, um, which was the winner of the Wonder Series hosted by the City of London for the Lon London 2012 Olympics. He is also the director of the Plethora Project, a research and learning project investing in the future of online open source knowledge. Um, he has taught and lectured at several renowned institutions across the world, including the Architectural Association in London, the University of Applied Arts in Vienna, the ETH in Zurich, the Bartlett School of Architecture, UCL uh, London, and the Ecole Nationale Supérieure d'Architecture in Paris. Currently, he's an assistant professor at USC's School of Architecture here in Los Angeles. Um, his research, called Gamescapes, explores generative interfaces in the form of video games, speculating in modes of intelligence augmentation, combinatorics, and open systems as a design medium. Um, so I would like to welcome Jose to SciArc. Thank you. Um, hi, it's a, it's a really big pleasure and an honor to be invited um, to the lecture series here in SARC. Um, I would take this opportunity to really to unpack 
some of the still premature research um, or line of research that I've been uh, bringing from London to, to this side of um, the country. Um, I'm going to start in a very personal way. I will try to unpack some of the conversations and some of the ideas that were carried as an alumni of um, DAA, where I studied on the, on the DRL program. And the conversation there um, was very conducive to the kind of research and, and the agenda that I'm having today. So hopefully I will be able to, to bring you in into that line of thinking. And then to uh, further develop some of the ideas of the projects in relation to games and architecture. They're mainly my concerns today. Um, so to start, um, I'm going to try to bridge that gap between what uh, was generative work and a lot of generative design work that I was doing back in London um, to what is today my gaming agenda. When I joined the DRL, uh, I was doing a lot of work in this platform, uh, processing, perhaps most of you are familiar with it. And in an interesting way, um, there was two different kind of camps happening within the AA. One, as you know, Patrick Schumacher uh, teaches in the AA, and he was very much into the whole parametrics. Um, but there was a smaller group um, that would argue that generative design was not in the same group, and it would be a very different one, one that would perhaps uh, deal with writing more code, uh, defining objects or virtual objects that you would release in virtual environments, and those would create nonlinear interactions um, that would perhaps embed the design intent of the designer. A difference uh, parametric design would suggest uh, more of a deterministic uh, series of relations, right? We would have a slider in something like Grasshopper and you would move it and you would see how the relations and the, and the variables would interact, but perhaps uh, you would still feel that the, the object, the design object would be very deterministic. And this is the kind of work that we were um, developing back then. Simple uh, agent interactions, uh, as I said, a lot of object-oriented work, uh, trying to think that the, the series of uh, local relations that could be established between virtual elements could be um, carried out by the simulation, right? I somehow started finding a problem with this kind of work. Um, this is uh, also some of the work that I was doing professionally with the firm BioThing of Alice Randaschek, uh, which I kind of uh, became a part for several years. And this kind of generative work uh, focused mainly on writing code um, for quite a bit of time until the point when you think that all the design intent of your project was very much embedded into it. Um, then you would press play and you would see this kind of um, system unfold. Uh, my issue with that kind of uh, strategy is that your design decision as a, as a designer, as an architect, was very much over, right? You had a, a process of developing this code and perhaps going back to it, but you would never be able to interact directly with what was happening in the screen, right? Perhaps you could switch some parametrics of it, you could switch some sliders here and there, but you would always see the unfolding of the simulations and, and be looking at them through a glass. And, and that was somehow of an issue for me. Um, how do you couple the idea of uh, decision making and intuition with a rigorous computational process, right? If you start kind of tweaking things around, that would seem um, negative or something, sometimes taboo because you're kind of corrupting the calculations and the performance of the system. But on the other hand, perhaps your own intuition and your own decision making could overcome some of the blind spots of the algorithm itself. So, I really start thinking what would be the framework and the platform in which you could couple those two things, right? Intuition and rigorous computational systems. And that looked very much like a video game for me. And I'm going to show you this clip of a video game that I really like. It's called Super Meat Boy. And uh, I will describe what uh, we could consider as play, right? Eric Zimmerman and Katie Salem describe play as a free movement within a rigid structure, right? And that couldn't be more obvious, I guess, in, in a game like this one, where the rigid structure being the environment uh, really um, pushes and forces the player to find uh, creative ways to, to solve this puzzle. I mean, you could perhaps visualize the trajectory that you need to actually reach the other side and solve the puzzle, but that couldn't be achieved right away unless you develop a series of skills and a series of a special kind of knowledge to, to do so. Um, so in a way, we have the intuition of the player, but then a very kind of rigorous engine running and creating constraints for it. I'm going to 
jump ahead to show you a bit of the end of this video, as it really took a while for the player to, to get to the other side. There we go. And what I like about this, this game is that uh, at the very end of the game, the game shows you that those paths, all the paths that you really need to take to achieve that goal, to, to reach that other side, um, were very much necessary and were very much part of your final output, right? You couldn't have reached the other side just by that kind of optimum path that you perhaps found, but, but just by ingraining in you some of the, the knowledge. So you couldn't, let's say, solve the problem before uh, attempting to solve the problem, right? And that's something that I, I relate very much with the design discipline. I was able to start establishing a, a relation between what we can call design and play as two in the same. So if we start jumping into the area of games and um, any kind of game, uh, virtual games or physical games, you start addressing what is the space of possibility, or um, let's say when you start addressing some of the game theory behind games, right? So take this example, for um, like the tic-tac-toe. It's one of the simplest games that you can have. You have a th uh, grid of three by three, and then you have two different icons or different elements that could populate that grid. And the way to just approach this, uh, at least computationally, would be to map all the state of possibilities of such, uh, this is the design space or research space for such a game. And this is something that I did when I was a kid and then you realize that there's a few strategies that would always lead to winning if the other player would actually, I mean, if you would start and then if the other player would not do the right move at the beginning, right? Um, but that's a very small search space. Uh, what happens when you have a slightly more difficult or a bit more uh, larger set uh, of variables, right? Uh, in chess, you have like a eight by eight grid, and then you have six different units per side. We do have algorithms today that can actually trace all the possible combinations of chess, right? And that's not the problem. The problem is that the computational complexity of chess uh, can be calculated as follows. You have basically 30 different moves roughly at every turn, and then you have an average of maybe 40 uh, turns uh, in an average game. And, and that would give us 30 to the power of 40. And that number is a huge, really huge number. So the problem of chess is not that we don't have the algorithms or the computational power to solve it, but rather that even if we would just try to map all those possibilities with the, all the computational power that we have in the world, it would take uh, still thousands of years to do so. so that's not the right strategy for that problem. The, I mean, and this is still a kind of a very two-dimensional grid with just a couple of, of different units. Um, this somehow hasn't stopped the, the field of artificial intelligence to pierce through this search space, computational uh, search space, where you would eliminate and, and try to find solutions, right? So what you, I'm showing you here, it's uh, an algorithm developed by Stanford. Um, where a robot is trying to localize itself in the plan of a building. And, and in this technique, it's called particle filters. What the robot is trying to do is just basically starts with a hypothesis that is located everywhere in the space simultaneously. And just by calculating this kind of blue rays show um, how the robot is collecting data. And you can see that quickly as the robot starts moving, it starts eliminating all those pieces of, or all those hypotheses that the robot has to kind of, um, confront them with the data required. So this really pierces through that kind of possibility space in a very, quickly, uh, in a very quick way, um, allowing to really navigate these vast possibilities, right? But there seems to be a different approach to that as well. Um, one very interesting approach, uh, at least for me, was um, an initiative called Folded. Um, Folded is a video game developed by scientists, uh, in this case, David Baker, and a team um, that try to replicate a protein uh, in, in digital environment. And they would allow any player for free to play, and uh, basically to discover and solve scientific puzzles. So basically the idea behind the game was to crowdsource the solution of scientific problems. Um, the game, two weeks after being released, uh, it really uh, produced um, a huge success. They discover solutions that haven't been solved by the state of the art algorithms. So in a way, some of the problems of proteins uh, had to do with a lot of visual and pattern recognition and kind of figuring, th uh, figuring forms in a spatial way. So that seemed to be a good approach for this problem. But what you're doing here, if you start thinking of 
thousands and thousands of players uh, playing a video game, is uh, you start kind of getting results. And many of these results would start following um, some sort of statistic uh, and, and a curve of what could be considered an average result and what would be considered perhaps uh, a good or an even extremely good result. And somehow I, I try to relate this idea to what Nassim Taleb called the black swan, right? We somehow, if we start using game design as a, as a design heuristic, right, we would hopefully find those extreme rare events, those events that, that overpass our own creativity or the creativity of the system as an average and, and takes us into the realm of perhaps something new and something novel. Um, Taleb describes this as, a, as the impact of the highly improbable. The problem that I have with this idea as well is that design becomes search, right? And this is perhaps what I was trying to get away uh, from the very beginning, is the idea that something like in form finding, you have, again, the idea of design as search. You're trying to um, reduce the variables to, to find an optimum solution, and it's a problem of optimization, right? So what are the scores of the game? And that would lead you to a, a winning strategy. Um, somehow I found that Eli Ayashi uh, wrote a counterpart to Taleb's book um, called The Blank Swan, and that somehow related much more to, to the kind of thinking that I had in relation to, to the probability and possibility space, right? And he describes this as a blank book, right? Whenever you're gonna write a book, you could think of it as all the possibilities of letters and words that you could put together to write a poem or a piece of literature. But for him, um, the act of creation, it was a blank, blank swan as opposed to a black swan. It's a contingent creation, um, that it's in the hands of a designer, of a decision maker. So that hopefully works as an introduction, a theoretical introduction to the kind of work that I'm gonna be showing and, and perhaps tries to, um, to communicate how I, I try to bridge the gap between some of the generative and artificial intelligence design work that I have been doing in the past towards something that could be more intuitive and something that could in involve, again, the intuition of a, of a decision maker within a computational process. Um, so I'm gonna be showing you now the project called Bloom, and for that, I would uh, start with the idea of negative entropy, right? Um, I feel like our profession has very much to do with this idea of negative entropy, entropy being a, a measurement of disorder and by defining negative entropy is the way in which things assemble or acquire order over time. Things like Lego and toys, uh, like Lego that represent this in a very clear way. You have disorganized or noisy uh, pieces of material that by patterning them or by finding information and data that would put those pieces together, you would acquire order. Um, today, there seems to be like a, a, a great deal of, of resources to, to do so and share that kind of information. Things like Instructables.com and the DIY Maker Movement are kind of flourishing because of a, a propagation of design patterns. And video games like Minecraft are, are doing their fair deal of educating young kids into the art of combining things, like a digital alchemy if you want, and, and allowing them to create these digital transactions, right? Converting materials into different kinds and then propagating these massive three-dimensional voxel spaces. Um, what comes out of that is a kind of a very complex uh, web of material, digital material properties that, that could be traced in, in many different kind of fan sites. So see, some of these are the ideas for, for the Bloom Project. The Bloom Project, as, as presented by Bicerling, was a, com a, a competition for the London Olympics that I partnered with Alessandra Shek um, from the Barlet. And we conceived something relatively simple. It's, it was just a one unit that could be combined and patterned in very different ways. Um, and it would be in the hands of the crowd to define its requirements or its kind of um, its action as a, an architectural installation, right? These are some of the initial drawings of we would consider a uh, urban furniture piece that would use the, 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 the cell itself as an array to become the structure for a much um, more organic creation of the public, right? So the idea here was that we would uh, release thousands of these pieces into a public space and, and see what happens, right? The, the piece itself was also designed with certain flexibility, knowing that um, the geometric um, 
design would define the patterns that you could create, but if, by adding a bit of flexibility, you would just bend or even allow the people to bend and break the rules of the game. So these are some of the initial renders of, of the competition, hoping that we didn't know the location yet, but we were hoping that people would just really engage with it. As it was a several stage competition, we, we tested several things. Um, materially, we were thinking of a, of a piece that would be very toy-like, something that could be very like not um, uh, dangerous, but also we were trying to measure how much time it would take you to build something meaningful or something interesting, and how much fun would you get, how, how could you engage with the different patterns, how it would collide with itself. Um, and at the same time, we were doing some of the computational simulation, right? Um, this is where you see these kind of two sides. On one side, we were thinking of a game that would be released to a crowd, and it's perhaps very difficult to write an algorithm to simulate how an 80-year-old thinks and how, what it would do with, with it. But at the same time, we, we did have the skills to just simulate this kind of L system or branching system in processing and in Grasshopper, right? So we could just tease out some of the patterns and see what would happen geometrically. But again, we were speculating that the most interesting part would happen afterwards in the hands of a, of a system of uncertainty, the crowd being that um, uncertainty. So many times when we present this project, uh, people ask me, well, so what, what really defined the shape of Bloom, right? Uh, you can see here, this is literally the moment in which we decided that on that shape, um, we did an algorithm that would allow you to, to control the shape of the, of the cell itself, but also its aggregation. It's, it, um, so you will be able to see both things at the same time. So you will be able to simulate, let's say, the aggregation of 20 or 100 of those, but then change the parametrics of it and go back and forward and see how it would twist and, uh, and turn. The, the general aggregation that we decided to go for had to do with perhaps going against structure, just because um, it was in the concern of the London Authority to not allow a large structure that could collapse in the hands of uh, many users, right? So we were hoping of something that would spiral very gently, and then it would become, like the level of difficulty of the piece would be its, um, its ability to become structure. And, and that was somehow the, uh, the main feature that would bring people together and, and have to, to find creative ways of making it stand. This is some of the design iteration over the piece itself, working with the engineers to we work with Arabs in this case to find uh, basically all the, all the simulation would go into one piece. And in some point, uh, we, didn't, we were not able to get it approved by an engineer because you would never know how many units would be attached to a particular one, right? In some point, it would inevitably, they would snap and they would break and there was some sort of risk and liability. It was a, Difficult project from that point of view because of the amount of uncertainty it included. So finally, obviously we would be able to create renders and simulations of that, and we went into fabrication. We got the project approved just because of time mainly, because there was never uh, a permit. There was never kind of a taxonomy that would describe what kind of project this is and what is the final output that it would have. Um, so perhaps because of the Olympics and, and the pressure, we were lacking in that point. Um, the process of fabrication was um, a simple um, injection molding. It would be a repetitive, a, a serial repetition of identical units. Uh, this is the way it works. You have this massive machine and you have basically two pieces of metal in CNC with the form of the, of the unit and then the hot plastic comes in and you basically get roughly, in, in our cycle we had two pieces per minute that would allow us to create maybe a thousand pieces a day um, just on time to create what we thought it would be the, uh, the amount of pieces necessary for the Olympics would be 60,000 pieces. We were short. We were originally targeting 100,000 pieces for the London Olympics, thinking that people would take them away, they would take them as a token of participation. It would be its way of, of saying, hey, I, I was there, I was just part of the game. But suddenly, like, nobody took these pieces with them. They really respected the, the installation and we ended up with a huge amount of pieces in our storage. So this was the piece as it came out. Um, 
the production line, producing this, these pieces very quickly. We had a, um, maybe two months to produce the whole uh, project and ship it uh, on site. This is the way it would arrive on site. And basically, the, the, the work that we had done digitally was easy to replicate in terms of the patterning of the piece to discover what are the main initial patterns for, for people to know what to do with it, right? Uh, different aggregations would be useful for motivating different groups and understanding how, how you could assemble something. Um, the project was presented in three sites, uh, simultaneously in two of them, UCL and uh, Victoria Park. And then finally for the Paralympics, it uh, was presented on Greenwich. And we were very happy to present the project, uh, and this is the way we presented it to the public before the, the gates was even open, right? We, we had a good time with a big team designing ourselves, um, the formations to be presented to the public, and, and there was no blueprints, it was all kind of just literally playing uh, with the structure, finding different ways of, of walking through it and making it architectural, and finding moments and details that would uh, be meaningful for us, or they would just somehow uh, reflect some of our interests. But as you can imagine, the London Olympics is a massive event, and this is one, both of these, the project was presented in live sites, and this is like how a live site works. Uh, you have the opening ceremony, and you have a huge crowd of people, and when you have a sculpture like Bloom that's supposed to be interactive and has very little room uh, for any interaction, what you get the next morning, it's something like this. Um, so it was definitely heartbreaking. Um, seeing that whole process of negative entropy, yeah, right, it was complete disorder uh, being, uh, people were destroying it um, to the point in which nothing, no pattern, no uh, formation happened. But the next day, um, after realizing what was going on, we saw the opposite process. Ourselves were starting building it up again, but, uh, but the crowd, knowing that there would be all these kind of Lego-like pieces uh, dispersed in the garden, there would be very much interested in playing with it and, and building it again. And this was the kind of organic process that happened every day, really. Like, it, it never stood more than three or four days. It was just always kind of falling and breaking, and then different patterns would emerge, and, and that would happen organically throughout uh, the two weeks of uh, Olympic Games. Uh, our process of documentation, uh, we thought that once the project was presented, um, our work really started instead of ending because we really needed to document uh, what was going on with the crowd. Uh, not only the kids, but everybody, uh, different groups of people would actually find interesting and perhaps new patterns with the project. People would use it in different ways, obviously. Um, but we were very excited to see that people would bend the rules, would break the rules, and, and discover their own kind of um, interest in what the project could do. Um, we were always kind of envisioning something large scale and architectural, but it was exciting as well to see that people would take in their own hands and meaningful ways, whatever those were. Um, it was also exciting to see that people would really come every day to, to try to learn the process and, and, and play with the game and leave these kind of sculptures or tokens of participation. Like we would come in the morning and we'd realize that someone left something behind. And that was a, a very exciting thing to do and to see and document. Um, we came to realize that the project was highly educational, especially for kids. It would teach a lot of math and rhythmicity, musicality, as some people would describe. And, and that has been some of the development today. We were lucky uh, to, to get involved uh, with the Archilab, the ninth Archilab exhibition, and be exhibited there. And this is the, we were acquired uh, by the permanent collection, but, but at the same time, we were able to to reach that kind of uh, connection with schools and an educational system to bring Bloom as a toy, as a game, um, to schools and, and to the classroom. And this is something that we're pursuing still today. Um, at the same time, was a lot of interest to develop a smaller uh, version of the product. Um, and we are currently in a product development cycle of making a much smaller piece. This is a 15 centimeter piece that was presented in E3, the Games Developer Conference here in LA. Um, so we'll see where that goes, but it's just slowly becoming a, a product that you would find in retail. So again, the idea here is that we design the system, design itself becomes a process of playing. Um, the next project I'm gonna show uh, really starts talking more in depth uh, of uh, 
a crowdsourcing as design. Uh, I had the chance to do, do a unit trip with some students in the Bartlett to Hong Kong, and I was very interested to, to see Hong Kong, um, perhaps through the scope of some of these games like Minecraft, like an urban voxel that, that would be very intricate. And we decided to do a workshop as some of the students were very new to the computation um, and, and this, let's say scripting processes. We, we thought of just doing a, a basically a board game workshop. And I thought that the board game was a really good medium to explore a very kind of slow computation, one in which the transactions between the different programmatic units would determine the growth and the generative growth of the, of the board. The students were interested in the process of cage housing and, and extreme density of the city of Hong Kong. And they devised um, board games that you could switch their rules. You would see how playing under certain specific rules, like players perhaps would be working on a competition, but some other set of rules would uh, promote uh, cooperation. So they were not representative or representational models of the city, but perhaps a small hypothesis of how urban growth was happening in the city. This, this was a different game. Uh, there was looking more of a, a, a block in, um, in three dimensions and seeing how particular units uh, would have synergies with each other and or basically create um, negative relations as well to just basically create a system of scores for a, for a tower. So one of the main ideas here is, is that we were not looking at a time-based process necessarily. Uh, time being understood as a continuous or absolute um, system, but here we were really thinking of a trade-based system, something where time would only happen on the local transactions between uh, agents within the game, right? So if you think of a turn in a board game, really time doesn't pass unless you trade and you uh, move the game forward. And those, those were kind of the key ideas to be developed on a uh, digital game. And, and I had the pleasure to work with Satoru Jihara that teaches here in SciArc, and it's here in the audience as well, um, to be part of one of the smart geometry clusters last year and develop this a digital game prototype called Block. Block, um, it's a game inspired obviously by games like SimCity or Lemmings uh, back in the day when I, when I was a kid. And you would see how systemic thinking or digital matter would be uh, modeled by, by in plan and section in different ways somehow by these, these video games. So they were very influential for, for the later development. And Block really sits at a scale between something like SimCity that tries to simulate the whole uh, city fabric and something like Minecraft that tries to simulate locally the material, um, the, ma uh, the scale of the material, right? And you have in Minecraft, you're basically designing at the level of the brick. So Block situates itself uh, somewhere in between. Um, you would have different units and those would kind of interact with each other housing, circulation, public space, or commercial units. And all of those would be interactive agents that would basically affect one another. Uh, we were very influenced also by, by initiatives like the Whole Earth Catalog, where you have a huge amount of uh, resources, of things that you could do and perhaps you were not aware of, right? And we thought perhaps if you could do a video game that would show you alternatives that the real world has, right? Like if, what if each one of these units would represent uh, something in the real world, you would perhaps play and discover how to repattern the physical world. Um, it was also very influenced by uh, an initiative called the Plant in Chicago. This is an urban farming facility that uh, it's based on the idea of elimination of waste, right? So all the different parts of the plant are based on how, let's say, uh, a particular uh, farming facility would create a waste that becomes the input for fish farming, and that would become the input for something like a brewery and so on. So everything like uh, the ecological interdependencies of the system would be studied to actually create a, a rich and interdependent network. So the game presents itself in a very simple way, uh, and it's trying to allow you to, to make a shop be thought initially uh, something that has inputs and outputs, right? You might have um, maintenance costs, like certain costs for the shop, but at the same time you will produce jobs and certain kind of um, particular effects over the urban fabric. Similar thing that would happen with solar panels or even farming, you would have inputs and outputs, and the way in which each one of these discrete 
units would be simulated would allow a player to discover um, relations. So this is the kind of um, game uh, urbanism that we were describing and hopefully opening it to the public to see what people would do with it. This is a video showing how the game works. Um, Satoru here wrote a, a really great algorithm of, of agents. Um, in this case, these are the people that you're seeing around that would be very much the evaluation mechanism. You would be able to describe circulation patterns and, and, and different criteria that would evaluate a public space. And so you could just get some degree of scores and understanding of what you're doing with the, with the project. Um, it was very inspired as well by things like MVRDV, Space Fighter, and some of the uh, earlier gaming initiatives in architecture. Uh, but we're hoping to, this is still under development, we're hoping to take it to something that could be available for free and, and develop a community that could play with the project and, and, and push, um, give us feedback on, on where to go next. This is a kind of evaluation mechanism that we have. You can switch into heat map mode where you can basically see what unit is perhaps not performing so well and, and then go there and, and solve some of the issues, right? Um, most of the time you do have multiple scores so that, that kind of red dot might not be just one criteria but a kind of an overlap of different criteria. Um, as I said, uh, we're currently still under development and we're trying to develop all the the back end of the project in, in regards to collection of data, collection of data of a user, and how would that benefit or create some sort of feedback into where the game goes next. Um, so that's still to be seen. Um, with that project, I can actually jump into the design agenda that I, that I have been working with students since London and later on here in, in LA. And that's called Gamescapes. Um, I'm going to start with the very first um, projects that we did, and hopefully the, the projects would evolve till the latest ones. Um, this is the work developed together with students. Uh, I often share some sort of credit with students because we, we create a lab that works together in, in, in two or three projects. And often you don't get all the skills in terms of programming to, to address some of these kind of high computational um, problems um, in a short span or a short semester. So, so students work together with me and a team to, to make these games the way I'm going to be showing them today. So this game, uh, Wireflies, is trying to, to create a brick that would transmit electricity. It would collect electricity initially and then transmit that electricity within the system to uh, store it and use it in different ways. So this is the game. Um, you have an interface presenting you with options as a player. And basically, it's a, it's a pavilion based on, on the building system that the students have conceived. The main idea here is to um, be able to create, as I said, this smart brick. And you would have some sort of visual uh, feedback of when these correct orientations would meet each other and eventually conduct um, information between them. This is the unit that would actually collect the wind uh, in the system. And by arraying many of those, you could perhaps get enough power to power lights and so on. So very much like uh, Minecraft or other games, what you're working here is creating a tile set, a set of uh, possibilities, and seeing how those would be combined. The game itself would be not necessarily a narrative game that has an objective, as let's say winning in some way, but an open sandbox where you could combine things in different ways. These are some of the physical experiments that we would always think that the games are kind of counterpart of a physical object. So you would have a massive uh, amount of a large audience playing with a virtual game, but then then that would correlate with a physical system. Um, the game starts with a tutorial. We have to kind of take in consideration that a, a new user doesn't know how the game works, and you take very closely the design of the interface and how a new user would engage it, not only you as an architect that developed the game. What is interesting about um, what starts happening is that you open up the game for a, for a new audience, for a new public, and you start getting lots of feedback right away and, and lots of creative bugs, right? Like this idea of, of the bug uh, is very much people taking the game outside the scope of what you were anticipating. Um, so you can see here some of the how the game works. But then eventually students and 
the public playing and designing with the game itself. Also, the idea of the design interface uh, or designing the UI elements that would allow a player to use the game is very much trying to think of um, human computer symbiosis, right? Like you're tr not only designing the geometry that it would be operating with, but you're also um, designing the way in which the software would interface the human. As I said before, you're trying to mediate something that could be highly intelligent algorithmically, but then you're also navigating the intuition of a player on how, what kind of decisions can you take at, at any given time, and how do you allow or to augment some of the decision-making process or even support different new ideas. So again, the idea of scores in this game had to do with energy collection and, and resource management. These are some of the images. The second project from this series, uh, again developed in London, um, it's Rian, very similar to the past project. It's a project that works on, on resource management, but also in this case of water, right? Um, the project had to do, the, had the idea of collect, like how do you go from collecting water uh, and desalinate that water if it's uh, from a soil environment and use that water for something like farming. So I'm gonna show you a quick video of this. So this is the, the game as it's presented to a player. In this case, you're working with a branching system, um, and that branching system starts in the water, and you're able to use the pipes as a, as a mechanism of transmitting the water information from one point to another, eventually reaching, uh, let's say, a collection point. Um, that would be, the data would be presenting of how much water is being collected and how much, let's say, planting or farming can you use. Um, obviously, that was the initial series of operations that you can do based on the tile set um, designed by the students, but then you can apply the same operations um, at a much larger scale and a much larger number of units. At any point, you have the full control over removing, adding new units, and connecting those units in different ways. Uh, it's not an algorithm that is building it up. Those algorithmic connections allow the snapping and, and basically all the, the connections to happen always in a very smooth way, but, but you're free to just break and, um, and reorganize the, the networks as you, fit, as you see fit. And in this, like you, you have two modes in this game. You can switch between water mode and uh, normal mode, basically that is the way in which you would see the project at all times to see some of the information and, and be guided by that, uh, that information that is being presented to you, right? So your decision-making process is a feedback loop between the information that you're creating but how that plays out in a particular uh, system. These are some of the final images of, of some of the design outputs. Again, some of the design outputs were created by the students. Some of them were a crowdsourced. Um, we had play testing uh, moments in which we would invite a much larger um, participation of students and other people uh, to, to play with the game and see what they could come up with. And finally, to finish up this, this chapter, it's this idea again, maybe I mentioned it already, is uh, the model of man-computer symbiosis that comes from JCR Licklider. Uh, it's opposed to an idea of artificial intelligence today uh, that was promoted by Marvin Minsky, right, where we would really leave the computer to take decisions for itself, but rather, how do we find ways in which the, let's say the designer in this case, becomes something more like this, right? This is a kind of a professional StarCraft player, and, and some of the studies show today that these players have a, somehow of this symbiosis with these computational systems that allow it to take decisions very quickly and, and manage really, really uh, complex systems. Um, finally, uh, to finish um, the presentation today, uh, I'm gonna be showing some of the work that I've been doing in USC and how that uh, research has migrated um, here to LA. And for that, I'm gonna be showing the Polyomino project. Um, this is a project that started by questioning some of the ideas of the non-standard architecture. Um, non-standard being understood as uh, a process of mass customization, file to factory protocol, and differentiation of parts. Um, what you have with a non-standard architecture is something like this, it's a jigsaw puzzle, right? It's, you end up with a huge differentiation of parts and then the problem becomes the logistics of how do you put those parts together. Um, 
Polyamino, it's a reconsideration of serial repetition, right? Uh, as it was Bloom and perhaps other projects in, in, in the agenda, uh, but explicitly is trying to do so by, by allowing a very small number of units, repetitive units, to be crowdsourced by, by a gaming engine. Um, the term polyomino comes from the notion of a, a molecule created of a series of squares. You could be familiar with uh, that in the game like Tetris. What happens in polyomino is that you have a series of discrete units that it's mainly how you arrange those units. The pattern of organization, it's more important than the definition of the geometry itself. So you have parametrics, sorry, uh, combinatorics over parametrics. Um, one of the key ideas behind uh, polyomino is to reconsider some of the pattern language of, of, of Christopher Alexander. And Alexander presents the idea of a system as a two-folded uh, notion, right? Within the notion of a system, he describes that there is a holistic idea of a, as a whole, right? You have a system that operates as a series of parts that are kind of working together, but at the same time, the word system describes a kit of parts, and that's what he defines as a generating, generating system. What I'm trying to suggest with polyomino is that we do not attempt to achieve holistic sets that work well together, but rather kit of parts uh, that are open and, and perhaps released to the public. We're not suggesting which would be the final outcome of those kit of parts, but we speculate um, with a larger crowd how those uh, kit of parts could be arranged. This is somehow, I feel it's a trend today in some of the current um, products and toys that you can find in, in different places. Things like little beats or kublets, modular robotics, seem to be uh, contemporary versions of a game like Domino that would allow a particular set of um, parts to be combined and recombined in different ways. But this, in my research, seems to come from a project from 1966, that's the Brown Electron, that literally tries to describe itself as an electronic domino, uh, and it encourages, encourages kids to, to create electric circuits in just by combining different modules, and those would be magnetic, and it would encapsulate some of the knowledge, the electrical knowledge, to actually create a circuit. Um, so this is the kind of tile set that you have uh, to create all sorts of electronic um, components. So for me, this idea of the non-holistic set, a set that it's a sandbox that is not defining a, a particular output, but a multiplicity of outputs, it's opposed to something that it's a jigsaw puzzle that could be only fit in one particular way. That was the kind of main um, ideas behind the polyomino agenda, the reconsideration of serial repetition. We started working with a uh, space packing system. This, in this case, is a truncated octahedron that would create a three-dimensional voxel. And as domino, we would pattern these particular units with dots to represent the connectivity and the topology of the system. What we went, ended up with, starting with very simple paper models, is kind of assemblies of, um, of these kind of three-dimensional dominoes that would propagate based on their own rules of, of topology. We realized that we could inscribe a, a much more complex geometry, one that would understand notions of connectivity and, and blur the notion of the repetition of the tiles. So we were thinking of something a bit more complex and something that could be manufactured uh, serially as well. And we were re developing a, a game engine or a game instance for, for basically populating these different tiles in 3D space. The key idea here, again, had to do with rotation and orientation of these similar units. And, and finding particular patterns and particular geometries that would blur the notion of, um, of the tile. As you can see here, um, there's no post process of rendering. We're trying to um, design at the same time where you're just taking decisions and seeing the work uh, as it is. There's no kind of a two-folded process of a representation and then a materialization, but those are kind of combined in, in the game engine. So this is some of the work of um, combinations and studies of, of what you could actually create with the system and some of the drawings of, of the combination of units. So as I said before, the idea here is to kind of look for combinatorics, not parametrics, right? Um, 
and try to relate that this, this could be a physical system and the, the game would really be a, a vehicle to explore in a much faster way the possibilities of a physical and a material system. These were units um, that were 3D printed just for testing and they were using a magnetic connection just to see what kind of assemblies you could achieve. Uh, so, to end, I'm going to show you some of the, the video of this project and explain a little bit as it goes along. Um, this project was framed in, in what I started calling from gaming to making. It was an attempt to start using this, this framework to, to bridge from the virtual world into what would be the physical and thinking that something like 3D printing uh, technology that is becoming very uh, ubiquitous out there um, could be uh, connected with something like gaming that is also very uh, prevalent in, in many households. So if you would allow a kid to 3D print um, a creation of a game, you would really connect two very interesting pieces of technology today. If that game is somehow already encapsulating intelligence or geometrical knowledge, those outputs do not necessarily need to be um, just noise, but perhaps interesting design uh, outputs, and interesting design variations. Um, and you can see here some of the, the work done with this project. Um, in this case, the students were developing a pavilion piece and, and trying to see how far they could actually uh, take uh, just the combinations and the recombinations of, of just two different cells. Uh, currently, we're kind of uh, collaborating with Stratasys and Unity um, as a 3D printing company and a gaming company to, to really do this gaming to making process a reality. Um, this is some of the outputs that we have been exhibiting lately. Um, and Stratasys has been very kind on providing this polymaterial printing, allowing for the game engine to still in a very rough process get to the, from gaming to the 3D printing output. And, and those are still speculations of what could be uh, a physical object in the hands of uh, any user today. So um, with that, I'm going to leave it there, I think. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs>